And it's important to say, you know, when in the book, you're not rallying against the all animal testing, but you just think there should be a, a much higher threshold than we've generally seen. Although it's important to say that obviously a great deal has changed since you, uh, since you published this book in 1975. But I mean, that's important to say. You, you do think there are some kinds of animal testing. Right. I'm, I'm not an absolutist. And here I differ from some of my colleagues in the animal movement. Um, that's because I am a utilitarian uh, fundamentally. So I judge actions to be right or wrong in accordance with their consequences, whereas some of my friend, other friends in the animal movements do take a stance on individual rights, which they think should not be overridden no matter what the consequences are. Uh, so, um, yes, as a utilitarian, I have to say that it's certainly possible. Um, we can describe a hypothetical case, and possibly there are actual cases as well, where the benefits either to humans or to animals, although it's usually to humans, uh, are so great that they outweigh the costs to animals. Um, and in that case, uh, I could not say that that is the wrong thing to do. Um, if you could do it on, on humans in ways that didn't cause more suffering, then that would be another option. Um, and I think often we, we could do that. But, but certainly you can imagine situations where we can't do that and where... Um, an experiment on a, a limited number of animals, taking every possible care to minimise any suffering, eliminate it entirely if you can, minimise it if you absolutely can't, um, and, and you know treating them with with that concern. But nevertheless, if this is the only way to solve some major disease that is causing uh, a lot of you know a lot of deaths or suffering. Um, then that could be a justifiable thing to do. Elsewhere in the book, you talk about the Renaissance. It's kind of like towards the end, there's like an intellectual history, you think, of, of speciesism. And, it, and, it, and it, it appears that this idea of the elevation of, of human beings, Renaissance humanism, and you know, then Cartesian rationality, you kind of see this as like the ground zero, of everything that's terrible about our relationships to animals. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, let me say... I'm not sure if it's the grand zero because it's not as if the Renaissance was following a period in which animals were better treated. Um, you know, it was following the the Middle Ages in which uh, Thomas Aquinas, as the leading Catholic theologian and the most influential philosopher theologian in Europe for centuries, um, said, uh, "We have no duties to non-human animals. It's it's not possible to sin against non-human animals um, because they." because of the God's dominion verse that we mentioned. Also, he mm. said, because they don't have immortal souls. Um, so we have no duties to them. There's no reason relating to the animal's well-being against being as cruel as you like to an animal. But the only reason would be that if you practice cruelty to animals, you might be cruel to humans as well, and that would be a bad thing. But, but the animal itself just doesn't come into that calculation. So, um, you know, when you get to the Renaissance period, uh, you know, you can certainly see some traces of uh, a different attitude that um, at least you know, in some respects may recognize um, animals and their concerns. Um, I'll give you one example, which actually I've been interested in for different reasons. There was a Roman novel called The Golden Ass um, about uh, a, a person who gets turned into a donkey um, and then is, the novel is told through the viewpoint of the donkey um, and the donkey suffers a great deal. In some ways, there's parallels to the 19th century uh, English novel Black Beauty um, by Anna Sewell, which was talked, told through the, the the perspective of a horse, uh, you know, who was also cruelly treated in 19th century London. Um, that actually was translated in in the Renaissance um, and uh, was used and read. So, you know, there was some concern for animals, maybe through the interest in in that work, but um, but a lot of the Renaissance did just put this idea of humans at the center of the universe. And I suppose what people were really saying is um, it's not God who's the center of the universe. They, they, perhaps they couldn't say that really openly. But they were wanting to celebrate humans rather as humans you know, not being this sort of fallen beings um, in this miserable world, uh, uh, but, but being humans as being something to, to celebrate. And, of course, there was some rediscovery of uh, uh classical Greek and Roman thought. So, um, you know, yeah, yeah, there was a boost for humans. But, but when it gets to the point where, where Descartes says that um, animals are not even conscious beings, that they're 
you know, yes, they make noises, but then so does your alarm clock. And, uh, you know, they're more complicated than clocks, but that's because they're made by God and clocks are made by humans. Um, and uh, so therefore it's okay to cut them open and examine uh, how their bodies function. And don't forget this is a period when there's no anesthetics. So you have to strap down live animals and cut them open to see uh, their innards. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much a zero perspective as well. It's 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 certainly no better than uh, than what Aquinas was saying. 